Are you wandering in the wilderness? Or are you a voice in the wilderness? Welcome to the Revival Cry podcast. This is your host, Eric Miller. Isaiah 40 verse 3 says, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The goal of this podcast is to encourage you to use the voice God has given you to make Jesus famous. Every week, we will share principles from the Word of God, interviews, and encouragement in order to strengthen your voice. Thank you for joining me today, and now here is today's podcast. I'll tell you the story real quick about Italy. It's kind of going to lead into what I have in my heart to share today. I, I guess you can title this, I Want More. <laughs> I Want More. And so, years ago, I mean, we've been missionaries in the Philippines since 2003. And several years ago, the Lord just put on my heart Japan, Italy, and Germany. And I thought, well, Lord, the war is over. I don't know why, you know, those three nations. But it was very specific. And... I thought going to Europe, well, that's different. We're, we're just white Asians now. So, you know, we're so used to living in Asia. It's, uh, it's who we are, you know. And going to Europe, I thought, well, that'll be different. You know, we're not going to be taller than any, everybody anymore, you know. But, you know, we've been going to Japan every year since 2004, for the most part, and we've seen the Lord cultivate that in Sierra's life and all of our family. But in 2017, a man named Keith Collins, who was one of the leaders in the Pensacola Revival, a very good friend of mine, he was invited to help start up a fire school of ministry, which we also have one in the Philippines, in Sicily. On the, in the city of Catania. And so he invited me to come and teach for a week on revival. Another, the next year I taught like for a week on evangelism. And I was really excited to be able to go and just see what the Lord had in Italy. And, you know, a lot of people think that Italy is a Christian nation. It's very Catholic. And... I would say that from, from my missionary friend, Paul Schaefer, who's been a missionary there for 47 years, he and his wife, they've traveled all up and down Italy. They actually haven't owned a house or had a place rented up until about maybe 10 years ago. They literally traveled with a ministry called Christ is the Answer and would set up a tent, preach the gospel, and disciple people, you know, help start churches and things. I mean, everywhere you go, the, if there's somebody who's born again in Italy, they probably know Paul and his wife, Julianne, and the team of Christ is the Answer. And so I asked Paul, you know, what percentage of Italy is born again? And he, would, he said, it from, from some of the studies that they've done and people that they know, and, and it's about less than 1% born again. And that's very surprising, because I don't think people would think of Italy as an unreached people group. <laughs> there's a lot of religion, but there's not a lot of relationship with Jesus. And so when we went there, and I came back. We always saw God move powerfully. The second time I was there in 2018, there was a young man. His name was Vincenzo. And Vincenzo was from the city of Jela, which is south of Catania on the island of Sicily. And he would drive an hour and a half to go to the fire school of ministry one way. And he was doing that, I don't know how many times in a week. But there was just this real hunger. And when I was there teaching on, I think it was the evangelism class, 
I just put the notes aside one day. The Spirit of the Lord just kind of came in the room and just began to lay hands on all the students praying and, and prophesying over them. And apparently he recorded whatever I said. I still don't know what I said, but uh, he recorded it and it really meant something to him. So every time he would drive to Catania, he would play that recording and, and just meditate on it. And in 2019, he messaged me. He doesn't speak any English. And we're, we use Google Translate a lot. It, it works very well. And uh, he says, brother, I'm, I feel like God's calling me to come visit you in the Philippines. And he says, I'm going to bring a translator with me. His name's Labario. And there's a young lady named Ellen who just got saved out of a lesbian lifestyle six months ago. She just got born again and is going on her first missions trip six months later. I like that. And they came, stayed at our building, which isn't a five-star hotel by any means, and just served, loved the people, did without pasta for about 10 days, and then we had to find pasta. But they did really well, and I was just impressed with their heart for, for the Lord, for missions. And so they went back, and when, when Ellen was there, we had her sharing in local churches. She, I, we had her on the radio sharing. It was just powerful how the Lord changes young lady's life. But our family really connected with her. So they go back. 2020, we come here. We get stuck. We're traveling up and down the East Coast at least five times in a couple of years, just ministering as we go. And then in May of 2022, Vincenzo is sleeping during the night and has a dream. And the Lord just wakes him up and says, bring, invite Eric to come to your church in Jela to encourage a church, stir the church for revival. And in the middle of the night, he, he messages me and says, would you be willing to come? And I said, yes. <laughs> And I, and I could say it that quick because every time the Lord has called us, whether it be to the Philippines or to Japan, these specific nations, there's always been like a Paul's Macedonian call moment where somebody had a dream or a vision. And it, the Lord just makes it very clear that that's the direction we're supposed to go in. But I was a little bit nervous because I thought, well, if we spend all the money for, and we felt like the Lord was saying for the five of us to go, if we spend the money to go, we don't know when the Philippines government is going to open up and loose restrictions and we got to get back there. But okay, Lord, you said to go. And then the church messaged us and said, we're going to pay for your and your wife's tickets. And I said, well, we'll just believe God for the three kids. They're about, a, you know, $3,000 total we needed for just the flights. And a church and western part of Pennsylvania I heard about that we were going just a very small church and their elders I, I don't even know how they found out we were going to Italy but they did and they prayed and the Lord spoke to them to pay for those kids tickets to go and so we we go to Italy in September last year we go for three weeks we go two weeks in Sicily and it's a pretty large church. There's several hundred people. The building is really huge. But the Lord just moves so powerfully. At the time, Ellen came. She, was, she goes to that church. And she had a young man who was with her who came to the Lord. His name was Claudio. And I think Claudio was kind of backslid but then came back to the Lord during those meetings but I didn't know that he had surrendered himself to the Lord at that time and apparently he told Ellen that he wanted me to water baptize him and uh, for whatever reason that didn't happen I had no idea he wanted to be water baptized he said he's going to wait for me for the next time I return to water baptize him and 
I told him later, I said, well, brother, just go get water baptized, you know. But he, he really wanted to wait. And interestingly enough, Vincenzo says, we want to have another conference with you. Do you know a couple brothers who could come? And so myself, Keith Collins, another brother named Ken Pounders, who has been like in a teen challenge type ministry in Alabama, serving, leading for 40 years. He's discipled hundreds and thousands of young men and women out of addictive lifestyles and you know this is the same ministry actually that if you're familiar with Steve Hill who is the evangelist at the Brownsville Revival um, Steve came out of that ministry as well so he knew Ken very well anyway they came and I told Vincenzo we could all come and Ellen and Claudio ended up getting engaged and they said, we're going to wait for you to do our wedding, to, to be a part of our wedding. And, and I didn't know that Claudio was waiting for me to come to water baptize him. So when we got there at these meetings, it was just, just so wild. You know, we're water baptizing Claudio on a full beach of people preaching the gospel and sharing what water baptism is. He gets water baptized. And then we go back and we're teaching three day, three times a day on evangelism, discipleship, and having, you know, revival type meetings in the evening. But I mean, it was just, it's been a full two weeks <laughs> of intense just ministry. And I haven't seen more demons come out of people than in all the 20 years that we've been in the Philippines like we did in Sicily. Like just manifestations, just people, just young people. One young man was manifesting so, so just yelling and screaming and fighting and pain. And we're praying for him. He gets set free. Um, we prayed one day and then the next day we prayed again and he seemed to be totally free. And then his mom heard about what was happening. She came. She gave her life to the Lord. And, I mean, it's just all this stuff was happening around us. And the meetings were just full. I mean, every night the meetings were growing. growing and uh, the night meetings don't start until 9 p.m. And we go to, like, midnight. And, I mean, people stayed. Nobody wanted to leave. And, in fact, the, the pastor of the church said that they're going to continue the meetings through the rest of the month and then just see where the Lord's going to take it all. But there's, it was, it's just very exciting. And now they want to actually start a fire school ministry there. And so we're, we're excited about it because they're focusing on uh, missions and wanting to raise up and send people out. And I said, that's what we're all about. So we're probably go back there again next year. We'll see what the Lord has in store. But that's where we've been. And then... We, uh, I'll be going back August 8th to the Philippines, and then Casey will come with the David and Hannah on the 22nd after they get Jonathan settled. So please keep our family in prayer. It's been a lot of transition and travel, and uh, but there's grace, and we thank the Lord for it. Yay. You know, during the revival in Pensacola, we heard it all the time, and I know they share it a lot at Toronto as well. You'd always hear people say, there's more. There's, there were even bumper stickers in uh, Pensacola that said, more, Lord. <laughs> and people would wear T-shirts, and that was a catchphrase that you just heard all the time during that outpouring season. And... You know, there's even a song on the vineyard, one of the winds of worship, if some of you remember those. I still listen to them all the time. But uh, there's one of their, there was a song called More. And it was just a, a constant thing that I think really gripped people's attention that there's more to the Lord than what we know. There's, there's more. And, and I never had heard anything like that. I mean, I think most of everything that we do, we compartmentalize. You know, we, we go to church on Sunday. We have our midweek meeting. Maybe we'll have a prayer meeting. You have your devotion time. You, you have everything that we do 
you know, we pray a prayer to receive Jesus and everything was so structured and organized and, and there was room for the Holy Spirit. But then when I started to see and hear that there's more, it, it kind of ripped the roof off and made me realize that and God is so much bigger. We all know that God is big. We, we, we've had a couple of words even about that this morning. That the Lord is, is huge and powerful. And we're, we're singing about His greatness and things like that. But to realize that there's more causes me to expect God to do something that is way beyond my understanding and way beyond my ability. I believe in thinking and knowing that there's more, it stirs hunger in us. Because some, we can get so used to and, and familiar with the way that we do things. And, and every church we go to is so radically different in a lot of ways. I mean, thank God we, we have the Bible, the Word of God, or else who knows what we'd all be teaching in all of our churches. And, and you know, I, I think it's unique how, how God expresses his body, you know, in different ways. And we all abide in the same principles, but we have different, you know, personalities and giftings. And, and everything is so mixed up in Philippines. We have a dessert called Halo Halo. And it's, uh, it's got ice cream. It's got cornflakes. It's got beans. It's got jelly candies. It's... It's all mixed up. It's hollow, hollow, <laughs> you know. And I think the Lord, His church is is very mixed. It's very different and unique, but we have the same foundation. And it makes me realize that there's more. That no matter how good I think one church is, or a ministry, or what we see going on. It's like the Lord says, no, there's, there's so much more. Here, go to Italy for a little while and realize how much more there is. Well, Lord, I'm a missionary. I've seen you move in the Philippines and Japan, all these. Let me take you over here. You're barely scratching the surface to see how big I am. <laughs> you know, and, and theologically, I think we have everything we need in Jesus when we're born again. Yet, you know, why do we still feel like we need to say that there's more? And I think we're just trying to communicate that when we say that there's more is that we have everything we need in the Lord when we're born again. And, but there's so much about him that we don't understand. And we, when we say that there's more, it kind of stirs up a desire within us to pursue God. You know, if, if you're in Italy and you say pizza... <laughs> People get hungry for pizza, and no matter how much pizza and pasta we had over there, there was more. <laughs> in uh, Psalm 42, verse 1, it says, As the deer, starting in verse 1, go through 5, it says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God. You know, in my body, I'm tired today. And, and I, physically, I, I don't feel that great. But my heart is burning for the Lord. When can I go meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. It's so easy to be caught up in the normality of life, the daily routines that we just kind of settle in and forget that there's more. My prayer is that there would be something that would come back to us here in the church again to rip off of our minds that there is a God who is absolutely massive. And he is so 
powerful and strong that no matter how hard and difficult things may be in our lives personally or in our countries and our families, it, no matter what is going on, in a moment God can change everything. Nothing is impossible for him. And what totally seems like, how is this going to change? What's going to happen, Lord? Where's the breakthrough going to come? All of those answers can be provided instantaneously. And I don't believe there's a moment where God has ever felt out of control. <laughs> I don't believe there's a moment where he has ever felt an ounce of worry, anxiety, stress. I believe he is so consistent with his nature and character to reveal himself to us that he longs for us to always remember that there's more. They said that Leonard Ravenhill, towards the end of his life, that Steve Hill, I believe it was, he asked Steve to get him uh, the word eternity and to frame it and put it next to his bed so that every day he wakes up, he would be eternity conscious. You know, you were talking about Isaiah 6 before. It's one of my favorite passages. I don't know if you can be a missionary and that not be your favorite passage. But there's this process of transition that takes place in Isaiah as he's seeing the Lord high and lifted up and it reveals his own sinful nature. And then as God cleanses him with that hot coal or with the blood of Jesus that we would know, he has this willingness where he says in Hebrew, he says, Hineni, here I am. I present myself to you. You are huge. There is more to you. I mean, I, I think there's, uh, God limits our ability to understand who he is because it is just so huge, just so massive. But there should be a constant amazement within our lives. I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit undone today. Because we see so much. And my heart is very burdened for revival because God did that in us. There was such transformation and change. But no matter where we go and no matter what a church has going on or, or doesn't have going on, just come to realize that it's going to take God to do anything. That no matter how successful we become, no matter how good the preachers are or, or how many great programs we have or how much influence we have in the society, you know, no matter how many prayer meetings we have, if we have prayer meetings going 24-7, there's been 24-7 prayer meetings happening around the world, some places for decades we know of a church in Okinawa, Japan that has maybe 50, 70 people regularly in the church. And with less than 20 people, they've had 24-7 prayer for several years. We all quote Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. How much more prayer do we have to do? I, I really don't know. How much more fasting? There's been prayer and fasting, you know, guys like Lou Angle and the call and the send. There's incredible things that are going on. I know Dr. Brown would, well, Michael Brown, the founder of our ministry and, and, you know, a real father in the faith to us, you know, he would go to Korea when Yonggi Cho was there. And there would be 50,000 people just roaring in prayer. Just, they, and the only way they could get them to stop is that they ring a bell. And everybody knows that it's time to, you know, settle down a little and let's, you know, listen or transition, whatever they're supposed to do. But there's, there's an intensity. There's a, a desperation. There's a hunger. I believe there is a cry being lifted up from the earth. And there is horrible attack of the enemy around the world. There's trafficking. We have, we have children. We just have four 
young children whose father was abusing them for too long. One of the daughters is pregnant and they think it could be his, his child. And those children were just taken out and put in one of our ministries, one of our other missionaries lead, Crystal Harden. It's a house of restoration. And now those kids are, are protected and they're doing well. You know, we would go to the garbage dumps in Davao City and, you know, see horrible situations. And I, I can just recount to you so many things that we've seen and heard. But if we just keep putting the Lord before us, then nothing seems impossible anymore. The reality is, is that there's only so much that we'll be able to do with our lives. And my prayer is that we just lay everything down. No matter what the price, we have to. Because there's so much that people need to hear that Jesus cares about them. That, that Jesus can heal them. That Jesus can deliver them and set them free. When I see people getting free and chains falling off their lives and their families be restored and marriages being healed, I look at that and I say, God, this is what you do. I can't make that happen. The only thing we can do is plant and water seeds. We cannot make anything grow. But as we continue to just think, okay, God, there's more. I want more. I want God to change Kingston. I was born in this city. I want God to move in power again. I want God to raise up young men and women who would flourish in the Spirit of God and in the Word of God and just set a, a blazing trail of revival fire all across the state of New York. Last Sunday in Jayla in the church, I was preaching and I had a prepared message and it was all nice and beautiful, organized. And then I just knew, I, and I'd labored over that, you know, putting it together, just praying and seeking God. It wasn't like I just came up with some thoughts and put them down. But I just knew that Sunday morning when I'm sitting there during worship that the message wasn't for today. <laughs> But I had brought with me a, a brick that my mother-in-law, who lives in Pensacola, Florida, she got for me. This brick was of the prayer chapel that was used during the Brownsville Revival School ministry days. And the buildings, the property was bought and they were demolished. And I had heard that they were going to do that. And the prayer chapel was just like a big oversized gazebo and it was enclosed and a friend of mine pastors a church in Dothan Alabama about two two and a half hours away and I told him I said Jason I said man you should go get that that prayer chapel and put it on your church property man I said because there were some intense prayer students thousands of people prayed in that place you know and there's nothing I, I understand God doesn't dwell in temples made by men anymore I totally get that but if if you go to Pensacola, even nowadays, which every now and then I'll go and I'll sneak in the church to go pray, there's something still there. I don't understand that. And I'm not trying to weird anybody out, but I don't know. I think that if we knew where the Ark of the Covenant was and if it was still there, we'd probably go rub our face on it or something like that. You know, and maybe that's why it's never been found. <laughs> My point is, is that my mother-in-law, not knowing, I told my buddy to see if he could get that prayer chapel and bring it over there. And they had already demolished it. And she went by and felt compelled to go grab me a foundation stone, a brick. And she brought it. When, when we arrived in Pensacola, she had it for me. I said, oh, that's so, so cool. Kind of a fun memento, you know. I'm not going to bow down and pray to it or anything like that or try and get DNA off of it or anything like that. But it was a memento of some a place that I prayed in on a regular basis. 
You know, that I knew thousands of students prayed in there, that people who came from other nations prayed in that place. God spoke to them in that place and said, go to the nations. Many people. So she got one for me, and I thought, maybe I need to get some more because there's a few places that I'd like to send a brick to. So I got, like, several more. And I actually, I have one with me today. But here's one of those bricks. It's kind of got dirt and sand all over it still. But I brought one with me to Jayla. I felt like God told me to bring one. And I had it with me that Sunday morning, but I didn't know how I was going to incorporate it into the message. <laughs> and then the Lord threw my message away. And I got up to preach that morning with my translator. And as soon as I start talking, the power goes out. And I said, okay, Lord, I know what you want to do. <laughs> and I knew I was just supposed to talk about revival. And as I did, I, I stepped down and they opened the back doors. They had these massive, huge back doors. They're probably 25 feet tall. They're huge. It looks like the temple. <laughs> and you see this beautiful scenery outside. And, you know, the air condition went off and all the people are sitting in there and I was wondering how long they were going to want to sit because it, it, it was pretty hot while we were there not a soul moved and I just began to share and I'm holding this brick talking about revival trying to communicate the burden of the Lord people just began weeping these young people we've been ministering to all week they're weeping they're on their face and I just go back up and I just said, anybody who feels a need to receive prayer today, I, I walk back to, to go back. And if you see my Facebook, I put this video up. Somebody took a video of it. I just come back and I double over and I feel this groaning come out of me. Groaning. There's no words to express what, what, what I felt. And I just groan and then people started coming up front and just crying out. They're praying for somebody to get delivered here. The young people are crying and worshiping over here. And the whole altar area was just completely full. And it was so intense. And all I did was say that there's more. I just want to read a little bit in uh, Luke 7. Luke 7, starting in verse 36. It's about a sinful woman who wanted more. She anointed Jesus' feet. Verse 36, it says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. This sounds like a pretty good Pharisee. The Pharisees get a bad rap for the most part. And most of them didn't want anything to do with Jesus because they thought he was a liar. They called him Beelzebub. But I think this Pharisee had a little bit of something in him that said, there's something about this guy that I want to pay attention to. So maybe I'll invite him to my house. And that was probably, to some people, a radical thing to do. And Jesus goes to have dinner at his house. And he's reclining at the table. Wouldn't you like Jesus to come to your house and sit at your table with you? <laughs> Recline to feel welcomed? Well, a woman of that town, verse 37, who lived a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And she wiped them with her hair. Maybe she felt embarrassed that her tears were all over Jesus' feet and that she was that close to somebody. Nowadays, we like our six feet distance, right? I don't. And she wiped it with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. It's not even her house. She's a sinful woman, probably known to be a prostitute. Somebody who's gained money in a way that people would look down upon. And yet she comes behind Jesus, not even supposed to probably be there, but is compelled because she knows that there's something about this guy, that there's more. 
that life is not over. That no matter how hard things have been for her growing up, that this man has the answers. And while some are okay with Jesus reclining on the sofa with them, she wanted more. She said, I don't want Jesus to just come sit and eat with me. I need you, Jesus. I am desperate for you. Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself. He didn't say it out loud. He just said it to himself, but Jesus still heard him. If he, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, she is a sinner. So at first, he didn't seem like a, fa a bad Pharisee. He probably didn't have any agenda revealed to Jesus by inviting, uh, inviting him to his house. But now his agenda is being revealed. Because he really didn't want Jesus because he's desperate to know the Messiah. He just wanted Jesus around so that he could feel things out and maybe get the information that he wanted so that he could make some type of decision of what he wanted to do with or without Jesus. And I would say that our churches are full of people like this. They don't want more. What they want is to be seen with Jesus. What they want is to say, yeah, I had Jesus over my house one time. He's a good guy. Are you kidding me? We're talking about the Alpha and the Omega. We're talking about the first and the last. We're talking about the Rose of Sharon. We're talking about the most beautiful person that has ever been seen on the face of this earth. And it wasn't a beauty about him that would draw our attention to him by his looks, but he carried the holiness of God. And when he walked by, people got healed. When, when, when he touched people, demons came out of them. Demons ran to him because they saw in the spirit who that guy was. And they said, why did you come to judge us before our time? And he just told them, be quiet. But they had to run up to him. Because they knew that they needed to put their tail between their legs because he was a whole lot bigger than what that Pharisee saw. Lord, I pray that you would remove any pharisaical things that we see you with our physical eyes or our spiritual eyes and help us to see you the way that this woman saw you. If this man were a prophet, he'd know who was touching him. Jesus answered him. Jesus answered him. It was only his thought, but Jesus answered him because he knew what was going on. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. <laughs> 41. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. I don't know how much the Lord's forgiven you, but I'm constantly amazed at the mercy of God upon my life. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had a bigger debt forgiven. You know, I think at that point, a light went off in Simon's mind that his religiosity wasn't going to save him. That there was somebody who he had looked for his entire life, but got caught up with what other people said that you should understand about God and was told that there's not more, it's just the Torah. You just need to memorize the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Memorize it and then keep the law. Now you've got your compartmentalized religion. You keep that and you do what we tell you to and you'll be accepted by us. 
But if you give yourself over to someone like this, then you're no worse a sinner than that woman. And Simon is struggling in his heart and his mind as Jesus is telling him this story about who's been forgiven a greater debt. Because he's starting to realize that that woman had a lot bigger debt to be forgiven of because she understood the power of humility. And he did not want Jesus there because of humility. He wanted Jesus for other reasons. You have judged correctly, Jesus said, verse 44. Then he turned towards a woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her? Do you see her hunger? Do you see her thirst? Do you see that she is longing, pursuing for more? Look, I know most of you have been in this body, this community of believers, for a long time. And I have known you to be a people who desire more. And I know that in the 90s there was an incredible outpour. I remember hundreds of people being in this room. And I know that you long for that again, not just to have a big church, but you long for the more of God again. And I don't believe that God despises small things. Because for the most part, we go to some churches that have hundreds of people and no prayer meetings, no time of allowing the Holy Spirit to move or have some type of heavenly vision and empowerment and transform lives and, and so much is compartmentalized. Oh, I, I, and there's different churches out there. You know, people talking about we got to be intimate with God. Do you know how rare to hear that is to hear in places we go to? People don't talk about that. People talk about growing a big church, having good programs, you know, having kids ministries and all these other things. And all of that is valuable and it's important. But if we forget our cornerstone, if we forget our foundation of why we do what we do, and then if we get caught up in the, in the normality of life, and it seems like things aren't happening even though we're trying to remain faithful to God and do and you're getting attacked whether it be physically or financially or whatever it might be and we're like, God, where are you? I want you to know there's more. I want you to not give up. God wants you to not give up because when he does pour out his spirit, I want to be exactly where I'm supposed to be. Because he will do it again. He made that promise to us. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That wasn't just for the day of Pentecost. That's not all flesh. All flesh is until we're out of this place. And it's over with. The burden of the Lord should be upon a people that is so genuine and so real that we say there's constantly more. We've got to have more. Do you see this woman? I came to your house. You didn't even give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. It was normal for people to have a, a mikvah or a place for your feet to be washed as you're walking in to someone's home. He didn't do that for Jesus. He didn't think those were beautiful feet. But the woman did. And she saw, maybe she saw Jesus' feet were dirty and wondered why the Pharisee didn't wash his feet. It's not what the Bible says, but I wonder. Maybe she had such a burden and a hunger that she says, how is nobody doing this for him? How can we all sit here and look at Jesus day after day and week after week and ignore that he has dirty feet? Lord, we believe your feet are beautiful. In fact, we want to be your hands and your feet. We want to represent you. And if that means I'm a foot, then praise God. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she had poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. 
This is a bold statement of Jesus. As her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus turned to her in front of all these people. And I'm sure there were many people. I think everywhere Jesus went, there was many people. And he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, did Jesus know that that was going to cause a conspiracy? Yep. Did he care? Nope. He knew who he was. He knew that this is the type of people. I came for all people. But when you find those hungry ones, they're the ones who are going to turn around and say, Here I am, Lord, send me. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who's this who even forgives sins? <laughs> Jesus said, The woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I want to play a song if I can. It's actually a song written in Italian by a young man who was on the worship team that we were at the church we were at. It's actually translated, I want more. Ho tramato la presenza tua Ora sono qui a versare Il mio le piedi tuoi La fragranza della mia lode Salga ora a te Stare qui alla tua presenza Voglio conoscere il tuo cuore Contemplare il volto tuo Avvicinami a te Gesù Io voglio di più Oh 
sono avvolto dalla tua bontà Quando sono qui davanti a te voglio solo darti gloria Thank you for listening to Revival Cry with Eric Miller. Please subscribe, rate, and write a review for this podcast on iTunes, cpnshows.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. To find out more or partner with our missions work around the world, please visit us at revivalcry.org. I look forward to being with you next week.